If it literally fell in that category in my life, I, I try not to grade, I definitely try not to grade preachers. But this guy preached a message that was so anointed of the Holy Ghost. He never stuttered. It was like the Holy Ghost stood up inside of him. He was preaching this word, and the name of the sermon was the God of what's left. How God will take what's left. He took illustrations and, and throughout the scripture, most of which I would not have necessarily chosen. But the Holy Spirit led him in that way. He talked about how that God gave instructions for the man of God to pick up the ashes and throw the ashes. And how many of you know that after something has been burned away, the ashes is what's left. God can take what's left and he can restore and he can move and he can make anew and he can do greater things than you've ever imagined. So I'm sitting there, this is the testimony. I'm sitting there and the Holy Spirit has literally arrested me. I tell you, he stopped me, Brother Spencer, in my tracks. And I sat there. I was on the edge of my seat. And I came quickly to the realization that the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. It was almost like that I was the only one in the building. Anybody ever been there? And the truth is, he was speaking to a lot of people. But he began to speak to me about how he wants to touch what's left. Amen. What's left of my life. Yes. Wow. I'm 58 years old. I don't know how many years I've got left. I don't know how many years you've got left. But I'm going to challenge you with the testimony that God wants to use what's left. Amen. Amen. What's left of your marriage, no matter what it's been through. What's left of your ministry, no matter what it's been through. What's left of you individually. And this morning, I come with that burning in my spirit. And I want to preach a message that I am simply entitled, Arrested by the Holy Ghost. Arrested by the Holy Ghost. I want you to go with me to Acts chapter 22. I need you to load your Bibles. Because some messages are just... You just came out lying some messages. I'm just going to tell you. You can't always outline the message. These guys, I know, I know God can lead in the planning just like he leads in the preaching. I know that. And I know that some people plan their sermons for the whole year. I'm not going to criticize them. That's, that's their way of, of doing it. I, I, I'm not going to critique them. But I'm just here to tell you that sometimes God puts a word in it. They cannot be outlined. It cannot be power pointed. Right. Amen. And I tried. <laughs> Sometimes he just wants you to tell them what I'm telling you. Amen. You see, in Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 11, it says, as Paul is is Luke quoting Paul says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law. And I was zealous toward God, as you are all today. I persecuted this way to the death, I binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest bears me witness in all the counsel of the elders, from whom I also received letters to the brethren. And I went to Damascus to bring in chains even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Now it happened, he's telling the story. Now it happened that as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, that suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me and I fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, 
why are you persecuting me? So I answered and I said, who are you, Lord? And I like he knew who he was. <laughs> and he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and they were afraid and they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go to Damascus. And there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came to Damascus. Now this story is recorded by Luke in Acts chapter 9. It's recorded again by Luke in our text in chapter 22. As Paul is standing before the mob, his defense before the religious folk of his day, he stood before them, he appeals to his Roman citizenship to deliver himself. The minute he begins to speak to them in Hebrew, that a hush came over the place. I can just hear I, I, It's like I can just be there in my spirit. They became quiet. They're, they're listening to a man who is one of them. I thought when I was studying this and praying over this, I thought of my time in Israel three or four years ago when it is quite an experience to hear people speak fluent Hebrew. I also thought of the awkwardness that I felt in Israel because you have to remember there are at least three different kinds or three different levels or three different factions of Jews in Israel. And there are a lot of people in Israel that don't like you as a Christian. They don't want you to be there. They have yet to accept Messiah. They have the same spirit, see, as these folks did. Well, Paul appeals to this, and they said there that he said, I'm a man born in Tarsus. He said, I'm a Jew, brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. And he told them this story. And he told them about being on the road to Damascus. I want to suggest that what happened on the road to Damascus to Saul was he was arrested by the Holy Ghost. That he was stopped in his tracks. That he was interrupted, even as it was last Monday night for myself. Because as I prayed this week, I said, God, you know, Saul wasn't a believer. He was, he, let's face it, Saul needed to be born again. And I, I prayed this week, I said, I said, I, I don't know how many of you there that need to be born again. And the Lord let me know right quick that whether we're born again or not, we need to be arrested. See, we need to be stopped by the Holy Ghost. Amen. We need to be interrupted from what we are doing, what we are saying, what we are facing, and our perceptions and our opinions and all that we are doing. Because you know what? We usually operate in our own will. Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. But, and we say that and we sing that sometimes. But usually we operate in our will. Amen. See, it's really not about us, but usually it's all about us. Amen. We eat what we want, we go where we want, and to, the, to a great extent, we say what we want. We are proud of our opinion and we post it on Facebook. We believe it with great conviction, we call it, and we believe it with great passion. And even as preachers, we do this. We get in the pulpit and we preach what's on our mind. We get in the pulpit and we declare what's going on. We declare, we declare what's happening. We declare what we think. Come on, y'all have me preaching. Yeah, yeah. You know what? Us preachers are bad about giving our opinion and calling it the norm. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll preach it and, and we say this is the word of God. 
When in fact it's not the word of God. It's the word of man. Many times. Or it's an opinion. And this is a serious flaw. This is a sincere problem that we have in the body of Christ. Amen. Your friends and your family that are lost, they do not need to hear the opinions of a preacher. Amen. This is tough, but I'm telling you, they need to hear the truth yes. from the Word of God. Amen. Now, they might hear a story. They might hear a testimony. They might hear about something that happened that might increase their faith. And that's fine. But I, 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 I've been guilty. The Holy Spirit is, is constantly reminding me that I'm not up here to preach just what I think. No. Preparation is important when you preach. Prayer and preparation is vital. I heard this week that Chuck Swindle once spent eight hours preparing for a 10 minute sermon that he gave at a funeral. We need to prepare when we preach. We need to prepare when we teach. We need to prepare what the Word says and what the Word means. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will interrupt our lives and interrupt our ministry as He did Monday night and begin to deal with me that what's left has got to be better than what's, what's prior to it. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. That what's left needs to be more scriptural and more biblical and more depth. It, it needs to be more anointed. The problem with the anointing is that some people misunderstand what the anointing of the Holy Ghost is. The anointing is not always the unction. And this is frustrating sometimes. But the anointing, you can whisper and be mildly anointed with oh, yeah. The anointing isn't always the unction and the, and the passion that we preach with. And, and sometimes we get these things mixed up. But I'm telling you, if this city, if this region, if this flock, if this family deserves anything, they deserve, they deserve for the rest of my ministry here to be anointed by God. To hear the word of the Lord. People say, well, it had not meant to, but well, you've done pretty good. You can say what you want, but I'm going to tell you, Monday night, the Lord had something to say. Amen. And that is, he arrested me. He found me on my journey. On the road to Damascus. Yeah, there were differences. But he arrested me. And he began to speak into my life. And that's my prayer that he would do today. You see, when we look on the road to Damascus, we find several things that I want to talk about. Number one, we find a man with an agenda. Man, he had an agenda. I mean, he had plans. I mean, we're talking about the one that held the cloak when they were stoning Stephen. We're talking about the one that had endorsed it. Some commentators say that there is proof that he not only endorsed it, he enjoyed it. He was a religious fanatic. Paul, Saul was a religious fanatic. He was committed. He was educated. He, he knew tradition. He knew, uh, he knew the rules. He knew religion inside and out. He knew the Jews. I'm going to tell you, when you go to Israel and when you're around Jewish, traditional uh, Jews here, Orthodox Jews here, you find the same thing. And it's hard because you have to learn to separate uh, your, your acceptance of them and your love for them. It's hard because they are very, very rigid. Now, there are, there are Jews who have been born again, Messianic Jews. And there actually is a great population of in between, between Orthodox Jews and Messianic Jews. And people that are very kind and very accepting. But I learned something when I went to Jerusalem. And that's this. Most of the people in Jerusalem were accepting because I was spending my money in Jerusalem. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to tell you, they were not interested in hearing what I had to say about Jesus Christ. They were still that rigid and still that, that uh, uh, strong that Jesus is not and was not the Messiah. I'm telling you, Saul was on the road to Damascus and he was on this long journey and he had an agenda. He was going, the Bible says, 
He was on his way to Damascus. He had full authority of the high priest, the elders, the rulers of the Jews. He was going to bring Christians back, those who had forsaken the Jewish tradition. He was going to bring them back to Jerusalem for punishment. Acts chapter 8 verse 1 says we see that Paul stood by while Stephen was being stoned. He said Saul was consenting to his death at the time. There was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Acts 8 and verse 3 then says as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Entering into every house and hailing men and women and committed them to prison. Verse 4 says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Paul was on the wrong course and he didn't even know it. Paul was on the wrong course and he didn't even know it. He was a man with an agenda headed in the wrong direction. I'm going to tell you, some of you are on the wrong course. I'm not here today preaching just about people who are lost that need Jesus. There are people who have been born again, but they're on the wrong course. There are people that are involved in church, but they don't understand the wrong course. There are people that have families, but they're on the wrong course. And the Lord is, is telling me this week to tell you that you need to quit resisting the rest. You need to quit resisting his spirit. Amen. You need to allow him to do his work in you. And see, this man that was on the wrong course, this man that had the wrong agenda, this man had no idea that he was about to be arrested by the Holy Spirit. My prayer this week is that God would stop you in your steps and begin to reveal to you the truth. And I wonder what would happen if everybody connected to this body, if every one of us had an encounter on the Damascus Road. I'm going to tell you, the modern day church is not getting the job done. I'm, I'm not here to critique. I'm not here just to be an enemy. Y'all know my heart. I, I, I know men and women of ministry are doing, many of them are doing God's will. But I, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you that I'm not a big fan of mega churches. Now, I'll tell you something. I don't know that God is a big fan of mega churches. It's hard to know them that labor among you when you don't know them. And guess what? It's hard to know them that labor among you when there ain't no laboring going on. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you, you put enough entertainment together and the, the multitude will show up. You put enough music and, and smoke and, and sound and, and enough money. I'm telling you, you can put something together. Now I'm not, I, once again, it, 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 please don't take me wrong. I am no man's judge. I'm no pastor's judge. I'm just telling you that I, I am a, I am a believer in relationship. Well, you've got to have a church that can know each other. You've got to have a congregation that can know each other. And so, what I'm saying to you today is that each of us need to allow the Holy Spirit to do His work. In us. So we find this man. We find this man who has got his own agenda. He's on the road to Damascus. And he falls to the ground. And we preached it my whole life. You know, as a young preacher, I preached it that he fell off of his donkey. That's what I preached. <laughs> Until one day I read it again, and it doesn't say anything about a donkey. <laughs> if, if you read it carefully, actually, this says he fell to the ground. So I don't know if he was on a donkey. I don't know if he was walking. I, I'm pretty sure he wasn't riding a bike. <laughs> he, do you know what he was doing? No, with me. You know what he was doing? He was doing whatever he wanted. He was so excited because he was doing his will. And he's on the way to Damascus and the Bible says that a great light shined, that there was a great light and there was an interruption. It was so powerful, the Bible says that, that, he, that he couldn't see, but he could hear. But the people around them, they couldn't hear, but they could see. 
I mean, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. See, God knows how to speak to you. To you. He can speak to you. If you let him stop you. If you let him apprehend you. If you let him. You see, if he can arrest you, he can take you before the judge. Amen. Well, if you can, if you, if he can arrest you, then the Holy Spirit can be your advocate. Amen. See, everybody needs an attorney. Amen. Amen. Everybody needs an attorney, and I think about the Holy Spirit. He's given a name in the scripture. The Greek word is paraclete. In English, it's the word advocate. It literally means someone who comes alongside us. It suggests that we're struggling and he comes to be with us in our struggles, in our help and help us. I'm so thankful for the Holy Ghost that comes alongside me and he represents me and he helps me. I felt him sit next to me. On Monday night, he sat down to me. He sat down next to me and all of a sudden I realized he had something to say. And he was saying that through that preacher. My vision, my passion this week, and I have had to tell you I have lost sleep. I have been seeking God, and it, this has cost me sleep. I told you not long ago that sometimes we get sick with preaching. That don't mean we get sick of preaching. It means we get preaching sick. That means the word gets in us and messes with us. And I've been there this week. And I'm just here to tell you my vision is that everybody in this house has a Damascus Road experience. Going on your journey, doing what you want, doing what you traditionally think is right. And the Holy Ghost would interrupt your life. And the Holy Ghost would apprehend you. And the Holy Ghost would change his, change your plan for your life. And he would begin to initiate. And this is what happens when the advocate or the paraclete, he comes to counsel us and to comfort us. No, we don't have a problem with the Holy Ghost company. That's we like that. We preach that all the time and we practice it all the time. Oh, Holy Spirit, comfort me. I, I was praying this week about comfort. I was praying about the comfort of the Holy Ghost. I, I was praying about being comforted by the Spirit. I was praying about this and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. Y'all with me? Yes. The Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, me speaking to you is not about comfort, it's about correction. Yeah. Him speaking into my life is about him correcting me. Yes. Getting me in alignment. Yes. To where I need to be. And so this is what happened. The Apostle Paul was Saul. He, he was on the road to Damascus. And the Holy Spirit knocked him down. Began to speak to him. And we began to realize that, that he was going. And he began to realize that he was going the wrong way. And so he was arrested. And God told him where to go. And he sent him. Ron Johnson. Yes. You on the wrist. Yeah, you mean I can't keep doing what I want? You're not allowed to finish what you're saying. You mean I got you gonna tell me now what I can do and what I can't do? You're gonna take me to the place where I can't do what I want? Yes, sir. What what happens if I resist? There'll be more charges added to you. More charges added to you. If I resist, and if I resist strong, you're going to taste it? If I have to repeat it, taste it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. We considered it. <laughs> Some people considered it more than I did. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Ghost will change you. Yes. So you're going to place me under arrest. Do I have to put my hands behind my back? I will put them in front of you, so if you, if you want to say some more, okay, behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> I told I told D, I said, I wanna, I wanna know what it feels like. I don't know what this feels like. It's not comfortable. 
See, now that's a little comfortable, sir. <laughs> You got to play along, brother. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be serious. You're all right. These, these are not the good hand codes. No, they're <laughs> All right. Now, just bear with me a minute. Can I, can I preach this a little bit more? You can. See, when you're under arrest, you're uncomfortable. Yeah. Do yeah. you know when you're under arrest, you're vulnerable? We talked about putting these handcuffs in the front because I want you to see that when you've got your handcuffs on in the back, you're vulnerable. You can't, listen, I can't raise my hand right now. I can't, I can't write a check. I can't uh, use a debit card. I can't, I can't turn up the, the volume. I, I, well, the truth is I can't do much about anything. You can't deflate. And you know what? You can't deflect. I can't deflect or defend. And you know what? That's exactly where the Holy Ghost wanted Saul. Amen. He wanted Saul to where he couldn't see it. He couldn't fit. He wanted to get his mind off of that wheel that he had. And he, 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 he wanted to arrest him. Now listen, when you are arrested by the Spirit of God, it's not always comfortable. Right. When you're arrested by the Holy Ghost... It's not comfortable. He, but it's all about you. And I want to tell you, these handcuffs are not comfortable. And if I had to sit down in the back seat of the car and sit on them and bang on them, it'd be more uncomfortable. But if I kept resisting, theoretically, he could tase me. I've seen the Holy Ghost tase people and they don't even know what's going on. Well, I'm on this. I'm going to tell you, I've seen people fall out of the Spirit don't even know what the Holy Ghost is up to. And then I've seen people fall out and they get up and say, Lord, thank you, Lord, for the blessing. Uh -huh. Honey, he's not just blessing you. Uh -huh. He's trying to correct you. Uh -huh. he, he's trying to correct you. Listen, people fail to arrest people to be mean. No matter what the news says. Right. Amen. They arrest people because the people need correction in their life. Yeah. They need a different direction in their life. Paul uh, was going the wrong way. He was arrested by the Holy Ghost and, and the Lord began to speak to him and he could have resisted. With me. He could have resisted and it, it could have got nasty. It could have got hard. He could have said, God, I don't know what's going on here. But you see, I, he could have said, listen, he could have said the same thing that he said to the mom. He could have said, don't you know I'm a Jew? Don't you know that I am a citizen? Don't you know that I was raised at the feet of a great teacher? Don't you know who I am? You know we tell God that sometimes. God, you try to judge. Don't you know that I'm a pastor of this church? Well, what about if he don't want you to be a pastor? Don't you know I've been going to church for years? I didn't know I was going to preach this good, but I'm going to tell you something. Thanks, listen. Thanks and all said, I'm preaching better than y'all shout. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that, that we need to understand that God cares about your direction. He cares yes. enough to correct you. Yes. Some of you are going through things and you don't know what is, is happening. And you're asking God to deliver you and God gave it to you. Yeah. He's teaching you to cope. He's teaching you and he's trying to bring you back into alignment. How many times? How many times did he do that? Pretty please. Willie, don't let him go. I know y'all like this. I think we like it just a little bit too much. Let's give, let's give Willie a hand.
Paul, Saul was arrested. Yes. And then he was given instructions. Yes. And then he had to go to a certain house. And there he saw a certain vision. Hold on my shy. that my boy. Until you allow God to arrest you. You're not going to see the vision. You're not going to hear the word of the Lord. You're not going to understand what he's actually called you to do. I want to tell somebody, God didn't call you just to be like everybody else. This is not a cookie cutter thing. I'm here to tell you God wants to use you. God wants to speak for you. God wants to... There's still some Apostle Pauls in us. There's still some Apostle Pauls in our midst. There's still some men and women and young people to the use of God. If they would just quit resisting arrest. And there was on that road a man with an agenda, then there was a divine arrest, and then there was just this mighty transformation. I want to tell somebody today that if you really want God to change your life, and I, I, need, I need you to focus with me for a minute because I need to just, I somehow God will help me to get this across. God's not satisfied with you being in a place where you're satisfied. We work hard and we think that because we work hard, we've reached a level. And that level is called comfort. Comfortable level. And God says, no. i got a place for you. There's men and women in this place that God wants to use you. His plan, His will is to use you mightily. Yes. We've, got, we've got 70 or 80 people in this room. I wonder what would happen if, if every one of us became an Apostle Paul. All right. Now this is where we've missed it. This is where we've missed it in the, in the New Testament church. We've convinced ourselves that there are no more Apostles and there are no more Apostle Pauls. I had a man tell me one time in a, in a discussion. He said, you mean to tell me that you think you could have the same faith as the Apostle Paul? Yeah. And, now listen, you know what I told him? I said, oh no. I said, I can have that. <laughs> he looked at me like I blasphemed the Holy Ghost. But I'm going to tell you, God's Word says that greater things shall you do. Because I go to my Father, this world, this city, Fort Payne doesn't need uh, carnal Christians. This church, this city doesn't need casual, comfortable people who go to church and shine their shoes. Tell everybody. They've got it going on. They need people that are uncomfortable. This city needs somebody that be willing, led of the Spirit, not in the flesh, to go wherever they have to go and speak whatever they have to speak. I'm not talking about being a weirdo. I'm not talking about being a nut. I'm talking about having the favor of God and the favor of people and praying and fasting and seeking God until God anoints you to get up like, like Rick did Monday night and preach a message under the anointing that brought change to my life. I want to ask you in closing today, will you let God arrest you? Will you allow the Holy Spirit to arrest you? When he says, put your hands up, you know what that means? It means surrender. Yes. 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 Come out with your hands up. That means surrender. Sometimes I think we reach a point in life where we think that God is just really thankful to have us on board. Oh, I'm just glad old Adam. I don't know what I'd do with Adam. Don't fool yourself. He'd do fine without you and without me. But God does have a plan for that. God does have a plan for me. God does have a destiny for you. 
We got people that have bought into the destiny message, but they have forsaken prophetic truth. Jesus is coming again. The rapture is going to take place. But between now and then, we need to all fulfill our destiny. I want, see, I, I can't pick anybody else out. Because, simply because of this, God's speaking to all of us. Will you give him what's left? Will you give him what's left? I don't know if it's two days, two weeks, two decades. I don't know. You don't know either. But will you commit yourself to prayer and fasting and study the Word? And let the Holy Ghost, by the way, the way the Holy Ghost arrests you is by His Spirit through His Word. Through His Word. Too many people go too many hours without being in the Word of God. You remember what I'm about to tell you. Real ministry is rooted in the Word. Real ministry is rooted deep in the Word of God. I want you to commit yourself today to being in the Word, to commit yourself to prayer, commit yourself to fasting. We're going to talk to the Lord of us. We're going to try to talk more about it on Wednesday night about fasting because, because I believe God is speaking to all of us about how to put ourselves on the road to Damascus, how to put ourselves in a position that the Lord will arrest us. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You might be here today. And you might feel the arresting presence of the Lord. The agent, the Holy Spirit is dealing with you. And, and he is saying, enough is enough. This is the last I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a work in your life. I'm gonna put handcuffs on your heart and I'm going to enslave you with this love, this love, this gospel, my work for you, my call. Anybody that just wanna come and pray this morning and say, I feel like God is arresting me. Anybody just want to raise your hand and say, I feel like God is arresting me so that I can get it right, so that I can be corrected, so that I can be taught, so that I can be led, so that I can be anointed, so that I can be filled. God wants to take me. I want everybody to say this with me. God wants to take me to a new level. God wants to take me to a new level. But he's got to arrest you first. Father, I pray over this flock. I pray, Lord, that you would take this work as seed, plant it deep in our minds and in our hearts. Father, when we look at Saul, we see a man that went through an unimaginable transformation that ultimately gave his life to the very cause that he called. Let there be transformation here today. One more time. No one looking around. Is there anybody that raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm away from God. I'm not where I need to be with God. Anybody just raise your hand. Pray for me. I'm not where I need to be with God. Anybody? Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Anybody else? Now, now everybody look at me. Before we go, I want you to hear my heart. Those of you that raised your hand will pray for you. Those of you that raise your hand will be fasting and praying for you this week. That a Damascus Road experience will take place in your life. Some of you didn't raise your hand, and I'm going to pray for you too. The fact is, I'm going to pray for all of you that will be arrested by the Holy Ghost. Give me praise in this.